Hi, uh, I'm John R. Gordon, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about my new novel, Hark. The night the statue of a Confederate colonel is torn down in the centre of a dying, opioid-scarred and racially divided southern town is the night two wild teenagers meet and start to fall in love. White working-class Cleve is broke and drifting into criminality, Black bourgeois row is alienated and rebellious. They say opposites attract, and who could be more opposite than Cleve and Rowe? When Cleve finds himself at age 17, home alone for the first time in his life, he summons the courage to invite Rowe to stay over. The young men's relationship looks set to move to another level when they are interrupted by Hark, a mysterious black vagrant who seems to possess supernatural powers and takes them on a strange and troubling journey into the past. Hark is a touching, vividly contemporary coming-of-age story, a compelling, fast-paced and ultimately hopeful tale of gay interracial love, and shows us how necessary it is to confront the evils of our shared history, however painful it may be to do so. So that's the blurb. Um, the wonderful black gay fantasy writer Craig Lawrence Gidney, who wrote a, a really cool book, A Spectral Hue, which I recommend, was kind enough to say, Hark mixes several genres with grace, aplomb, and undeniable queerness. It's audaciously provocative, sexy, and spooky all at once, and very much of the zeitgeist. Hark came out of a lot of, of dif different things fed into what made me write it. Um, the most obvious thing, perhaps, was the Black Lives Matter movement itself, which obviously is a touchstone of this story where Confederate statues are taken down. And it's interesting that was a a black but also a queer-led movement, or it is still a black and queer-led movement, and um, their audacious challenge to uh, the white system, really, to say the police, mostly white police officers, must stop killing black people. Um, and this was incredibly powerful. And it also reflected America's particular history, wherein the police really evolved out of um, slave catchers and slave patrollers and of course after slavery ended the various the Jim Crow laws the, the criminality uh, criminalization of vagrancy which meant black people could not move around they were trapped as sharecroppers you know the police very much evolved out of the out of that history so police killing black people was a continuity not a break the new thing was that people were filming it so it was seen by everybody beyond dispute. Um, so, and the Confederate statue thing, again, speaks to the past. They were, as people probably know now, mostly constructed as propaganda uh, exercises. These cheap, tinny, badly made statues uh, were made long after the actual end of the Civil War um, to, again, to intimidate black people. Um, so that was all very much a natural frame. That was at the moment I started writing the book. I was inspired in a very direct way by, by an African-American woman, a literary agent in New York, who championed repetimania for a while, my previous book. And, and she said, well, why, her speciality was young adult books. Why don't you write something with teenage protagonists? Why don't you write an interracial tale? And I just really liked the idea. I, and I wasn't finished with the very Southern Gothic landscape of drapetomania so this book is set in a modern extrapolation of that um setting my, my fictional county of welt county extrapolated into the present day and the dying on its arse opioid scarred town of clay pit it's funny to have written um something where a particular historical loop brings it right into the present moment so I'd started to worry that my reference points, Confederate statues, Black Lives Matter, you know, which when I started writing the book several years ago, would feel just that bit out of date. But of course, as we know, the, the tragic and senseless killing of George Floyd led to this amazing resurgence of Black Lives Matter protests globally and the issue of, you know, um, uh, taking down statues of slave owners and profiteers of slavery has actually suddenly become incredibly contemporary again. Um, which is 
uh, good for the reception of the book, I think, and of course tragic for human history that these things have not drifted out of out of uh, date. As you know, I'm a an editor and a publisher and a dramaturge as well as a, an author. Um, I want to continue to write. Um, obviously, um, so I've got several books I want to write, and I want to um, publish more books by underrepresented writers. The, the press that I founded with uh, uh, Richard Beadle Blair, the theatre and filmmaker, um, is this queer of colour centric press. And so, you know, our thing is trying to represent and project underrepresented voices and help people who feel they're not allowed to speak to find a voice and put that voice out into the world. Um, and that seems enough to me you know that's if I'm an activist that's my activism um, and mentor and support other writers yeah so very much focused around that it was inspiring reading um I've been reading a book of uh, speeches by Toni Morrison and one of the things that's inspiring about them is that she's just so centered in the world of the wor of words and writing and that is her work and she doesn't try to be all these other things and there's something quite centering and inspiring in that. I'm an optimist about human beings and human nature and the potential of people. And I, I think the book does show that, that you can, that love can win through if you face up to things, if you look life squarely in the face, if you look the past in the face, you can find ways to start to move beyond its constraints. Um, I think one needs clear sighted uh, clear sightedness, not colour blindness, which is what you can sometimes get in, in some liberal narratives. Um, I think we have to look at our pasts and we have to analyse them and face up to them and, and see what can be taken from them and how one can move on. But I think that is possible. And I think, you know, love is possible and I think love develops through seeing clearly, through facing up to things, facing each other. Um, I think there's, there's a lovely quote by Antoine Saint-Exupéry who wrote The Little Prince, where he said, love is not two people gazing into each other's eyes. Love is two people standing side by side looking out at the world. And I think that Cleve and Roe, that the, the, the book takes them on the journey, really, that their love goes from being that, that looking inwards to being able to, as companions, as a black man and white man, be able to stand together hand in hand and look out at the world. So um, that's my message of hope, really. <laughs>